the notes. So many notes. Hi guys, how you doing? Nick Jennison with Guitar Interactive Magazine GI Plus. It's Monday. We're doing the thing that we do on Mondays, which is hang out and talk about the guitar. And today, as you can see, we are down in our London studio filming some content for you guys because, of course, we have a new edition of the magazine coming out soon. So if you're not subscribed to our mailing list, hey, listen, you know what to do. Go to guitarinteractivemagazine.com. You'll find all the information you need. I want to take a quick second and welcome you on board. Thanks for joining us. If you're one of our returning streamers, Always lovely to have you. If you want it for our new viewers, I can see we've got a few actually, which is pretty cool. If you're a new viewer, make sure you say hi. We'd love to hear from you. We've got a little community thing going on here. You're very, very welcome. Glad you came and joined us. Drop us a comment. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know what you're playing today, what you're working on, what guitar you have in your lap. I've got my new guitar in my lap, which I've shown you guys a couple of times already. This is my Maybach Convair. It is gorgeous, as I'm sure you can see. James, can we just quickly throw to the uh, the left-hand close-up cam? I'll show the guys the guitar, because it's nice. Look at this, there we go. Oh, would you look at that, right? Look at that lacquer checking on there. It's a fabulous beast. So that's enough indulgence of my guitar, I think. But. Uh, I like it a lot. I think it sounds pretty cool. Plays great as well. So today we're discussing all things shred as we have for the last few weeks. So we've been doing our shred primer. This is part three. And over the last few weeks, we discussed uh, a couple of core concepts. We established some patterns that you can play with your, um, you know, your newfound shred drops props, easy for me to say, your newfound shred chops. Uh, we also talked about uh, whether legato or whether picking is the thing for you, whether certain picking styles are the thing for you. And last week we had a little bit of a chat about um, how you develop speed, a little bit on things like sports science and how you practice and how you um, set up your pra practice routine in such a way that you actually develop the kind of adaptations that we're looking for. Today, we are focusing our attention primarily on picking. So if you're a person that, uh, through our experiments, have found that picking is the thing for you, and you go, oh, picking feels pretty good, then this is great. We're gonna boost your picking chops today. If, by contrast, you were somebody who, uh, you know, you found maybe the legato thing was a little bit easier, this is also good, because it means that we're gonna hopefully add another string to your bow here by tackling the most difficult part of picking, which is crossing strings. I'm sure you would have figured out. We'll get to that in a bit, though. Uh, before we do that, though, just want to say a quick moment uh, and remind you, if you're enjoying what we're doing here, a couple of ways you can help us keep the lights on. Um, you can do the following. The easiest and uh, cheapest, most free, way of you to help us keep the lights on is to drop this video a like. So if you like what we're doing here, hit the like button drop us a comment, share this with your guitar playing friends. All of those three things really help us to reach the most guitar players possible. We wanna get this information out there. We wanna help as many guitar players as we can. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you're not subscribed to us already on YouTube. It helps us grow the channel exponentially. It really, really does help and it costs nothing. It's great. So drop us a comment. Also, if you have questions, don't be afraid to drop a comment down below. We'll be answering your questions as we go on and in the dedicated Q&A a little bit later on. Also, perhaps the best way you can help us out is you can go to the URL down here, which is guitarinteractivemagazine.com forward slash GI hyphen plus. That's the word plus, not the symbol plus, not one of them. Um, but the word plus, GI hyphen plus. We will get more guitar lessons just like this one on our exclusive lesson platform, GI plus, which also houses a course that is dedicated to the topics that we're talking about today. The course is Picking Strategies Part 1. It's helped a whole bunch of players get their picking chops together. I think it'll probably help you out too. We'll talk more about that as we go on. But before we do, let's just say some hellos because we've got some streamers in the house. Let's see who we have, uh, who's new, who's joining us, who out of our returning streamers is here. Uh, unfortunately, Marcin, who is uh, normally the first one here, can't make it today. Uh, that's cool, Marcin, you can catch it on the replay. You guys can too. If there's anything that we do that's a little too quick for you, don't forget, once this is done, you can catch this on the replay. It's gonna live on our YouTube channel uh, for the foreseeable. Uh, so Marcin, we'll see you next week. Good luck with your new apartment though. That's really exciting, man. PJ says, hi Nick et al. I like that, I feel like I'm being cited. I actually had a student uh, when, I was, um, <laughs> when I was working at the previous university I was at. I had a student who, um, who Harvard referenced me for like one of my videos and I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, that. That won't pass second marking. But I feel like I'm being uh, referenced, which is nice. So, so, hi, Nick et al. Managed to get to uh, 144 BPM, six, uh, 16th notes with three note per string scales and a bit faster with repetitive patterns. That is killer. That is really, really motoring, man. Um, still bumpy, but getting there. Thanks to you, Nick, and uh, of course, all here. Man, that is fantastic. What a great result, right? I'm really pleased for you. Now, that 144 is a magic threshold of tempo because we're bumping 
bumping up against that 150 kind of region. It's in that ballpark where things stop being slow enough that we can actually pay attention to individual notes and we have to uh, like kind of chunk things and start to think about them in little units of music. Really, really interesting, really exciting stuff. And of course, you hit upon another little nugget there, which is that you were able to get faster with repetitive patterns versus with straight scale playing. Now, that is something that many players just fall into instinctively. Um, and we feel as though maybe there's a deficiency in our playing because we can't play straight scales as fast as we can play patterns. There is a reason why patterns feel easier and often sound more musical too, but we're going to get into that. We'll get there. So who else do we have in the house? Timothy Appling is here. Hoy from the Florida Keys. Uh, hi, Nick and fellow Shredders. Time for part three. Timothy, it's great to have you. Foghorn is just here. Uh, I'm saying hello to Kim, but Kim's in the room. Kim's literally over here. He's just waving to everybody as we speak. We've been talking about this stuff off camera. Uh, Kim's had some breakthroughs with the Shred thing over the last few days, so we've been kind of chatting about this stuff. Um, and we're going to chat with it, uh, chat about it to you guys too. It's going to be good fun. Uh, Sacred God Slayer is here. Good to see you. Our Shred correspondent, nice fast guitar player as well. We love a bit of that. Uh, Keith MOF is here. Uh, Eric Gale, I nearly had kittens when I saw this name. I thought it was Eric Gales for a second there. But uh, Eric Gale says, uh, Hi everyone. Hi Nick. I hope you're all having a great Monday. Chilly, rainy fall day here in Canada. Looking forward to the stream. Eric, it's good to have you on board. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you being here. Steve McD is here. Good to see you. I'm finding this hard already. I usually play blues, uh, blues rock, but would love to shred. Well, maybe today is the day that we crack that nut. We'll figure that out. David Yates says, evening, guys. Evening, Nick. David, it's good to see you. Uh, response Audio is here. Uh, has, oh, Response Audio is Eric Gales. There we go, as if by magic. Had to switch YouTube profiles. I was wondering about that for a second. I was like, is it Eric Gales? Is it that Eric Gales? Response Audio, we appreciate you being here, uh, no matter what your name is, uh, on the, uh, the heading. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Timothy Appling, um, some really cool observations going on here. It says, uh, uh, what do we get here? Oh, yeah, that's great on the BPM to PJ. Practice time is everything. I've also been practicing uh, around the same, but maybe not an accurate. Oh, that's really cool, man. So you've been getting up to that sort of speed as well. That's huge, right? These are massive. Says, Nick's lessons advice really helps for sure. That's really kind of you, man. I appreciate you taking the time to say that. Uh, Rory Lisbon says, shredded cheese. My favorite kind of cheese. I think there's pizza in my future. Uh, Phil Jones is here. Uh, not a shredded by any means, shredded by any means, but uh, it's great fun trying those patterns he taught us. I'm, I'm glad you're having fun. I'm having fun with this stuff too, so. Who else do we have? James, our uh, esteemed cameraman and audio technician for the evenings in the house. James, good to see you. Uh, I can literally, I'm literally looking at him and I'm looking at James Seption going on. Uh, Daryl Queen is here. Good to see you. Gavi Gaiva wants says, Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Helmut Strap is here. Uh, Mark McNish is in the house. Cow Cat is here. Good to see you. Um, I also thought it was Eric Gales. Uh, magic. Cranker Tom is here. Love a bit of Cranker Tom. Just traveling the world with his guitar. It's fabulous. Uh, only in freezing Germany today, not on the moon, or uh, it's just like our guitar traveler is fabulous. Uh, Daryl Queen, been working on some of these patterns. Uh, when I bust, uh, when I bust, let me, let me just read that a little more clearly. Been working on some of these patterns, uh, and when I burst, I think my pick and hand really wants to play eights, and my finger and hand wants to stay in triplets. Ah, interesting. So that's where we start to go quick, and we talked about this last week. That could potentially be um, the case. It's quite possible where, you know, you start to play fast with the left hand, the right hand doesn't quite sync up. That's one of these hand synchronization things people talk about. We will get to that, that's an interesting one. Uh, hey, are you the incredible bulk, says my friend Craig. Could you imagine? Um, I'm, I'm trying to get smaller, man. I'm trying to shrink down into a little weight class. Uh, you also have Ergo Hogg is here, good to see you. Mark Manish is here, good to see you. Um, just been back to journaling my practice. Last entry, nine out of 10. Fantastic, that's, that's killer. Journaling your practice, really, really important. Uh, who else do we have? Adam Baum is in the house. Uh, just going to make sure we haven't missed anyone. Quick reminder, Mark Carter is here. Mark, good to have you. Thanks for coming on board. Uh, I appreciate you being here. Quick reminder, by the way, if you've got questions, drop your questions down below. We'll answer them as we go. We've got a real healthy collection of streamers in here. Uh, Rick Elliott is here. Black Crow Busca, good to have you guys back. Mustache Metal is in the house. My friend Sean is watching. Mal Riley is here. We love a bit of that. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> Mustache Metal. Yes. Congratulations on the powerlifting podium, by the way, uh, Nick. That's some heavy metal. That is indeed some heavy metal. We love a bit of that. What other walk of life do you get to have, like, just, like, enormous hair, and I get to come and play my guitar in front of all you guys and talk about the guitar, and then I also get to go and cover myself in chalk and talc and lift heavy weights. It's not a bad existence, really, is it? So anyway, let's get down to the meat of today's session, which is 
the uh, mechanics of picking. So picking is one of those things that some folks will just fall into. We've all met players who, you know, when they sit down and they play quick, they can just do this picking thing and it seems like a magic trick, right? I wasn't that guy. Like it took me ages to square this picking circle. Um, turns out that there are some instinctive players out there who can just figure this stuff out, but you don't need to be that kind of player to be able to do this stuff. Similarly, um, I always use the analogy when I talk to my students about this of uh, myself and my sister. So I'm a, I'm a vocalist. My sister is also a, a fantastic singer. She's killer. She woke up one morning and um, at age seven, I think she was, and decided, mm, singing sounds like fun, and opened her mouth and Aretha Franklin's voice came out. I'm like, what the ever-loving F? We're too early in the stream to swear. Um, but just unbelievable, just a natural talent. Me, completely the opposite. I had to learn, I had to figure it out on the job. But, you know, couldn't be done. It's one of those things. Picking is the same. So, anyway, let's get down to it. So, first of all, what are we talking about when we're talking about picking? Let's go to the close-up cams real quick. I'm gonna go to a clean sound. When we are picking, you'll notice we have a right-hand cam here as well. The right-hand cam is very important. When we're picking, what we're fundamentally talking about is a sound. This might seem like a semantic or an academic difference, but what we're trying to achieve here is the sound of pick on string, as opposed to the sound of finger on string. There's a finger, there's a pick. Do our lines sound like fingers? Or do they sound like pick? It's a sonic difference that we're looking for here. We're looking for the difference between that clacky sound of a pick or the comparatively less clacky sound of fingers. How we get that clacky sound of the pick at speed, it actually kind of doesn't matter. There's lots of ways we can do this. And we're often told that we have to do it a particular way. You have to be able to do strict alternate picking, let's say, or economy picking is the best way to pick. I've heard put, or you know, you need to pick A, B, C, X, Y, Z way. In actual fact, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can do this. And it's more about finding an approach that works for you and leans into your natural tendencies rather than trying to fit somebody else's approach to the way that you do it. Just because it worked for someone else doesn't necessarily mean a particular approach is going to work 100% uh, for you. This is evidenced by the fact that we have so many great players out there. This is not me just like going, oh yeah, you know, just feely feely, you know, like just do what feels right, bro. Uh, it's evidenced by the fact that we have so many great players out there who can do this stuff with techniques that are on inspection very different to each other. So uh, we struggle, for example, to discern who the superior alternate picker was between, let's say, or the superior picker, let's say, who was the superior picker between Paul Gilbert, uh, Aldi Miola, John McLaughlin, um, Ingvar Malmsteen, Eric Johnson, uh, Eric Gales, the list goes on, Frank Gambale, Guthrie Govan, who is the better picker, I don't know, I'm not making that call. These guys all do this stuff with huge success and every one of their techniques is different and every one of their approaches is wildly different. So let's get into the, uh, the meat of it. If we go back to our close-up cam real quick, what I wanna do is we're gonna do this together as a little exercise. I wanna take the fifth fret on our G string, we're gonna hold that down and I just wanna take this fifth fret and I wanna see if we can pick this quickly using this down up picking motion. Now what this should feel like is it should feel as though the pick is moving in a straight line from one side of the string to another. It won't be on inspection under a microscope, but that doesn't matter. It feels like uh, it feels like a straight line. Now this might come out as a rotation in the wrist. It might come out as a side to side movement of the wrist. It might come out as a movement of the elbow. If you look at the close up cam, we'll do this again. There's a rotating motion. Good camera cuts, my friend James. Can we get some appreciation for James in the comments, by the way? There's some side to side wrist motion, rotation. Here's a bit of elbow. They all work, all three of them work. So whatever works for you, we're just gonna do this and try and get that side to side motion on the go. So once again, side to side, fifth fret on the G string, that's all we're after. A little bit of circular movement is fine. Human beings do not move in straight lines. We are rotational animals, uh, quoting Arthur Jones there. Great salesman, exercise physiologist, not so much, but even still. 
hopefully that should feel pretty comfortable. We should be able to get it up to a reasonably fast speed. This should tell us that playing fast on a single string is not necessarily the problem, right? That's not really an issue. We can play fast on a single string and it should be fine. Let's make this a little more difficult for ourselves. Let's fret ourselves a power chord. This time the power chord is gonna be fifth fret on the D string and then seventh fret on the G string. Fifth fret, seventh fret. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna play with a, let's say a tremolo picking approach again, but we're gonna to aim to do four beats on the lowest string, four beats on the highest string without stopping. What's a beat look like? Like this. So with my foot tapping away, we're gonna go like this. One of those is gonna feel good. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I'd rather say that might feel good, might feel terrible. We'll figure that out, but I wanna know in the comments from you if that feels all right or if it feels disgustingly hard. Let's do it together, ready? One, two, three, four. feel okay? Did it feel really hard? Let me know in the comments. Now undoubtedly this probably would have required a bit more concentration than just picking up a single string even though we didn't need to move our left hand. So it doesn't seem like left hand uh, synchronization is necessarily the big issue here um, if that makes sense. It doesn't necessarily feel like the left hand and the goings on there are actually the problem with the picking. It seems like maybe the string crossing is the important. So here's an interesting one. Uh, Mark Carter uh, says, uh, hard, agree. Helmut Trapp says, hard, agree. Totally agree, right? One of those things. Uh, Rick Elliott says, uh, Matteo Mancuso technique so you can share. Right, listen, okay. All I can share about Matteo Mancuso's technique is that it is incredibly impressive and I can't do it. That's all I'm gonna say. But guy's a great guitar player. He's the future of the guitar. But he comes from a very difficult, different tradition. He's, you can tell he's been Pima educated. He's a classical guy. He's got the nails for crying out loud. Um, fabulous guitarist. Unimpeachable in my book, right? One of the best technicians in the whole world. Um, but it's completely different to the likes of you and I. It would be like if you had a third hand. Do you know, imagine for a second if we had a guitar player with 12 fingers in the left hand and we tried to learn their technique. It's not going to do us much good. We, we, can, we can admire Matteo Mancuso and go, you're great. I have one of these and need to figure out how it works. <laughs> So we're just gonna, we're gonna buy that. We're gonna pretend he doesn't exist. Um, so anyway, so carry on. So the reason why this is difficult anyway, the reason why this is difficult, ah, mustache metal in clutch with a comment. Says uh, easier when changing with economy strokes for me anyway. Now, this is a fascinating puzzle that we're gonna figure out here. So the difficult part of getting the string to string transitions on the go here is not necessarily the getting of the pick from one string to the next string, it's how we do it without clattering in to the string that we're doing, that we're already playing on, or the string we're about to play, and how we do it without disrupting that smooth side-to-side -side movement that we established felt really comfortable. In the first example, well, the way we do this is we take our side-to-side -side movement, let's go back to the close-up cam, we take our side-to-side -side movement, uh, in fact, let's just go straight to the picking cam. So we take it and we angle the side to side movement. This is what we've referred to before as pick, uh, pick slanting, but a better way to think about it, uh, again, the creator of these terms, this guy called Troy Grady, you should definitely check out his work. Fabulous, just like change the game with all this sort of stuff. Um, now, the way he describes this now is not as the pick slant, but as the escape. So he refers to it as either downstroke escape or upstroke escape. Now, what this means is that if we want certain pick strokes to escape, Rather than playing in a straight line that goes this way, literally straight, James has been an absolute hero and brightening that up because my guitar is black. That's a perfectly straight line from side to side. Instead, we get this, which is the same straight angle, or this. PJ says clap aboard award for James. He's earning his keep tonight, let me tell you. James, is that because Kim sat behind you? Is that why? <laughs> but uh, we need some James. So anyway, this is one of the, the positions we assume. This is another one. 
these are both still straight lines, traveling in a straight line here. The only difference is the straight line is not going this way. It's either going this way or going this way, one or two other. Now this enables us to pick in a straight line, but have one of the pick strokes escape the strings. And this will allow us to transition cleanly from string to string. How do we achieve that? Well, let's get into that real quick. So first of all, if we want, let's go to the both counts here real quick. So if we want a downstroke to escape the string, we have to align the bones in our arm in such a way that the downstroke moves away from the strings as we pick. And by contrast, the upstroke moves in towards the strings, but still in a straight line. If we want the upstroke to escape, we want the opposite to happen. We want to align it in such a way that the upstroke pulls away from the guitar's body and the downstroke goes in towards the guitar's body. There's a great Eric Johnson video. Uh, I think it's from the fine art of electric guitar where he even talks about this. And he talks about this idea of picking so that the upstroke comes away from the guitar's body and the downstroke goes into the strings when he does the... He's Eric. Lines that I'm struggling to play today apparently, but that's fine. Silly me, I decided to do a stream on Shred after reviewing acoustic guitars all day, so my fingers are minced and the power lift me on the weekend, but even still. So the, the way we achieve this is not necessarily by focusing on the direction that we were picking in, but if we go to the outside cam, the main cam now real quick, just go to the, the me cam, the, the lots of me, like the, the actual face on cam, there we go. The way we achieve this is by orienting the bones in our arm in particular ways. So we have two bones in our forearm, right? We have the, the radius and the ulna, but as far as we're concerned, we need to think about it just as the thumb side bone or the pinky side bone. Now, the direction that these bones are pointed in, the pick will follow. So what we do is if we want, if you imagine the guitar's body is here, I'll just do it like this so you can see. If we want a downstroke to escape the strings, we angle the bones in our forearm so that the pinky side bone is off the guitar's body. It can be still down, but it's very important that the thumb side bone is on the guitar's body. If we want the upstroke to escape, we angle the bones in our arm in such a way that the pinky side bone is on the guitar's body, but the thumb side bone is off the guitar's body. Now, what I want you to do here, we're gonna go back to that picking experiment where we do our, our tremolo picking on the power chord. Here we're gonna go back to the power chord. There's two right hands, can you believe that? Let's get both hands here, James, if we can. Um, I'm being very demanding of him. Look at that, that's slick. Uh, we'll go to the fifth fret on the D string, seventh fret on the G string, but this time what I want you to do is I want you to align your arm so that the pinky side forearm bone is touching the guitar's body, but the thumb side forearm bone is not touching the guitar's body. This is gonna set you up so that down strokes go into the plane of the strings and up strokes come away from the plane of the strings. So once again, that thumb side bone is gonna be up in the air and the pinky side bone is gonna be down. I'll show it here. This bone here, thumb side bone, up in the air. This pinky side bone, that's gonna be on the guitar's body. It's gonna look like this, and we're gonna play the same thing. Fifth fret on the, G, on the D string, seventh fret on the G string. We're gonna go four beats on each, tremolo picking, approaching each new string with a down pick, and we'll get this. together. Ready? Four beats on each, pinky side bone in the air. Ready? Here we go. Let's try two beats on each. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Let's try one beat on each. Here we go. One, two, one, two, one, two, one. Two, one, two, one, two. Let me know in the comments if that felt easier than the previous example. That should feel more together. The reason for this is we're allowing ourselves, we're allowing ourselves to maintain that straight line picking movement. We're just tilting the line. It's literally all it is. So it's the same movement. If I do this, same movement, same movement, 
same movement, same movement. We're just changing the line that it's in. We're just turning it to and fro. This is a very, very powerful thing that we refer to as uh, pix landing, but also we refer to it as upstroke or downstroke escape. Now, the next thing we're gonna do with this, we're gonna play some lines. So, here's the first line we're gonna play. We're gonna go back to our um, three, um, our, our three note per string scale shape that we did the last few weeks. Now, as a reminder, this is a shape that we refer to as, you can call it a number of things. You can call it A Dorian. In context, how we're gonna play it today, it's gonna to function as C Lydian. Don't worry about why that is, but if you want some help with this stuff, we've got a course on the topic, and I'm gonna take a quick second and show you that in a second. This is uh, a course called Mastering Modes Part One. We'll get to that. So the shape in question, going back to our close-up left hand and right hand counts, we have three, five, and seven on the lowest two strings. If you've been following along, you'll be familiar with the shape. Four, five, and seven on the middle two strings and then five, seven, eight on the highest two strings. Once again, three, five, seven, three, five, seven, four, five, seven, four, five, seven, five, seven, eight, five, seven, eight. It sounds like this set against our Lydian backing track that we're gonna play along to. You can get these backing tracks on the Guitar Interactive YouTube channel, by the way. Give us a subscribe if you're not already subscribed. It's gonna sound like this. Play it at some speed. That's our shape. We're gonna play some lines on this, but I'm gonna set you a quick challenge as the next little bit rolls. I'm gonna show you a course here real quick. And while we're learning this course, or while you're, while you're watching this little video about the course that we have available to you, I want you to do the following. I want you to try and play this line in two different ways. I want you to try and play it with a double pattern on each string. So that's finger one, two, three, one, two, three, and then move on which is going to look like this on the close-up cam. You'll get... A little slower, that's... on a clean sound as well. That's one way to play it, but we're going to play it at speed. The next way we're going to do it is exactly the same, but we're only gonna play one repetition on the lowest string. It's still two repetitions on all the other strings, but on the lowest string, only one. That's gonna go like this. So only one repetition on the lowest string versus two repetitions on the lowest string. We play two repetitions on every other string. Those lines at speed are gonna sound like this. Here's the two reps on every string. Here's one rep on the lowest string and then two reps on every other string where we get this. I'm gonna set you the challenge, playing those both. You can just play them up in the air, play them whatever, however fast you want, it's free time. While I show you this, if you want a little more help on your modal playing, if you wanna be a little bit better at figuring out what these scale shapes actually do in a musical context, we've got a course for that. This is gonna take a minute of your time and then we'll come back, we'll play this stuff, we'll talk about why it works. This is Mastering Modes Part One, available on GI+. Link in the description. When we come back, we're gonna solve this puzzle. Modes, what are modes? How do I use them? When do I use them? Well, modes are one of the things that the pros use to add excitement and color to the guitar parts, and there is no reason why you can't use them too. Now, for some reason, people, especially certain online guitar teachers, love to make modes seem complicated and scary, but I'm here to tell you they really, really aren't. And in fact, if you know the pentatonic scale, I can show you how to play modes with just two extra notes. 
In this course, I'll show you how to play killer sounding guitar solos using modes without any of the mystery. You'll learn how to play musical sounding solos all across the neck in any key, crucially without sounding like you're just running up and down scales. So, if you're ready to take this next step with me, click the link to find out more. I swear I knew it was the same backing track. <laughs> I promise that wasn't just a happy accident and it was the same backing track that we're using. It was definitely just me being a, a massive pro and not just being like a, a lucky fluke, but even still. So we got some comments coming in here. Here's a few really good ones. Um, so um, PJ says, I start the one rep with an upstroke so I can continue uh, with downstrokes for the remainder. Very cool, right? Very, very good observation there. Let's talk about what's actually going on there. Um, so. If we uh, take a look at the, the two repetitions version, if we start this with a down pick and we assume that we're in this postural position where this bone, this thumb side bone is off the guitar's body, that's gonna mean that upstrokes clear the strings. So upstrokes move away from the strings, downstrokes by very definition will then move into the strings. What this means is that we can then play down, up, down, up, down, up, with total impunity here, we go like this. Down, up, down, up, down, up. Notice the position of my pick in that right hand close up, right? The pick is up in the air. It's cool, we can stay on these cameras, James. So it's up in the air, ready to transition to the next string. So what I can do here is I can play the same thing. Down, up, down, up, down, up. Down, up, down, up, down, up. I'm not having to readjust picking angle at all. This means I can maintain the same posture, move it all the way across the strings like this. Piece of cake, right? Dead, dead easy. Now, that one repetition at the bottom can throw some people for a loop. Here are some possibilities. Some of the possibilities are that we play down, up, down, and then notice the position of my, my pick here in that right hand close-up cam in the top corner. I am now stuck on the A string. If I want to play that A string with an upstroke, I have to go up and around it, which takes time, disrupts the flow of my picking, like this. Yeah. So here we get that clattery feeling. Yeah. And then we can maybe start with an up pick, but then we're back to the same problem on the next string. So here are the solutions. The solutions are thus. We either do what Crank -a Tom has done and put in a little sweep where we go like this. Put in a little sweep where we go down, up, down, sweep. And this has brought us back to a down pick for the start of the next set of repetitions. So we go down, up, down, sweep, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, and we're back in that pattern. That's one solution. Another solution as highlighted by uh, our friend PJ. We start with an up pick. Nothing wrong with that. We go like this, we go up, down, up. Notice I'm free, I'm up in the air. That works too. Yet another option is we just do a little hammer on and we just don't pick all the notes in the first string. We go like this. Either we play down, up, hammer on. We just don't pick all those notes at all. We go like this. Would you notice? You'd notice now, I've pointed it out, but if I was playing midstream like this, you're much more likely to notice the out-of-tune bend than you are to notice the fact that I didn't do, uh, then pick the low E string. Like that's not, not something that people are gonna punish you for, I promise. Now there are three options. Uh, other option, other option. Oh, Cow Cat uses swiping. Now that's something we can do, but with this particular line, uh, we're not gonna get into swiping too much today, but you'll have to continue swiping because 
if we play this line, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, we'd have to then continue swiping. It can work, for sure. Uh, you need to be a little more muscular with your approach if you do that, but it's fine, it's a viable approach. I wouldn't be the approach that I would necessarily use for this whole line. But I would do, personally, I'd do something a little more like Cranker Tom's approach and do the sweep. But the point with this is all of these are fine. The next strategy that we do, which is another way to do this, is all we do, let's just go to the close-up right-hand cam real quick, and then we'll come back to these cameras. The right-hand cam, we just flip the orientation of our hand. Now we do this by, instead of having the pinky side bone down, we flip to the thumb side bone being down. Pinky side bone is up. Watch this. If I play down, up, down, now notice where my pick is. My pick is now up in the air, but I've just done a down stroke, ready to greet the next string with an up stroke. So what this gives me is down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Every up stroke is clear and up in the air and free to move. This works in both directions. It works in both directions. It works with every picking mechanic. It works with rotation. It works with uh, wrist to wrist move, wrist side to side movement or deviation. It works with elbow movement, all of the above. Here's a comment from uh, our friend Kenrick Blaze. It says, I'd like to buy the picking course. Well, the best way you can get the picking course, real quick. Uh, we'll, we'll show you a trailer for the picking course as we go as well. The picking course is called Picking Strategies Part One. It's actually got a solo study in it where we play all sorts of outlandish lines to show you how to play it with all of these strategies, just as a way of demonstrating that there are no lines that are impossible to play if you have a preferred strategy and that you don't need all of them or even more than one of them to be a successful picker in the sense that we defined earlier on this stream, which is being able to play notes fast with the click of a plectrum as opposed to the soft sound of a hammer on. How you can get this course, my, my man, is you can go to the URL down here, go to guitarinteractivemagazine.com forward slash GI hyphen plus. If we were gonna sell you this course, it would cost you more than a year's membership to GI Plus. So you'd be just as well signing up for a, either a month, let's see if you like it, or sign up for a year. It's way cheaper than just buying the course because the course is pretty friggin' big. Uh, Kim's left, so I could ask him for a special deal, but he's gone. Uh, but we kind of all agreed it, like each course would probably cost more than a year's membership, so we'd be just as well making it a membership thing. So yeah, go to the URL down below, you'll, you'll find the course. It's Picking Strategies Part One. I'll show you a little trailer on it in a little bit. So anyway, Going back to that approach there, let's do the same thing, but this time what we're gonna do is we're gonna realign our bones in our arm. We're gonna realign this bone so that now the thumb side bone is on the guitar's body and the pinky side bone is either touching or up in the air. This is gonna set us up so that our downstrokes escape the path of the strings, upstrokes will catch in the path of the strings. Now, let's try playing that one repetition, then two repetitions, two repetitions, two repetitions. That should feel easier. Let's go to the close-up cam, so I'll throw the backing track on. Here it is with this new uh, downstroke escape, thumb side bone touching uh, kind of approach. It's gonna sound like this. Now you may be feeling potentially like this feels awkward. And if it does, that's interesting, that's okay. Because what we're doing here is we're eliminating some possibilities. What I want to know from you is when we try that, does that feel better or worse than the previous setup? It's like an eye test. It's like one of these things where they go better, worse, better, worse. I had an eye test recently in case you couldn't see. Didn't buy any new glasses yet though. Being uh, quite lazy and I'm stuck with my last pair I've got since the Anderton's guy stood on my other pair. <laughs> That's fine. It's all love. They're great guys. Uh, anyway, so uh, I want to know whether this like downstroke escape thing feels better or worse because this is going to reveal some tendencies about your own playing which you're going to use to inform your decisions going forward as a when it comes to like refining the strategy that you're going to use so it could if it feels more awkward if it feels better then great we, we've won right if it feels more awkward it may be that you prefer to stay in this upstroke escape posture all the time which you can definitely do or it may be that you prefer to stay in the upstroke escape posture while you're 
ascending across the strings and flip it while you descend. We're going to try that now. Let's do the same lick, the same line, but this time we're going to do the following. We're going to play, starting with the downstroke, we're going to play. Uh, he has an interesting one from Daryl Queen. Daryl Queen says, uh, um, upstroke escape is where I am because I use the meat of my palm for muting. Aha, interesting. Okay, that's, uh, I'm inclined to agree. So this meaty part of the palm, you have to use this bit of the thumb for muting. Uh, I'll show you to the camera because that would help. You have to use this part of the thumb for muting in the uh, upstroke escape. Uh, the downstroke escape, rather. Uh, upstroke escape, we can use this part of the palm for muting. It's, both is fine, um, but we'll figure that out. So anyway, uh, a cool comment from Justin Marshall says, I have that AFD100 amazing amp. Can confirm. Uh, it is very much an amazing amp. Uh, it's Kim's amp, actually. Kim brought this in. And he's like, oh, hey, this is too loud for my house. Can I I'm gonna keep it here in the studio? And I'm like, uh, can I turn it up and play it really loud? He's like, it's kind of the idea. I'm like, yep, cool, all right, sounds good to me. Great amp, so can agree. So anyway, our descending lines. We're gonna play the same fingering pattern. It's gonna be eight, seven, five, eight, seven, five on the highest strings, uh, seven, five, four, seven, five, four on the middle two strings, seven, five, three, seven, five, three on the lowest strings. You get the idea, right? So what we're gonna do here, we're gonna begin by playing one repetition on the highest string, and this is gonna require us to play with a downstroke escape posture. That means thumb side bone is touching the guitar's body. One repetition here, two repetitions on each of the other. It's gonna sound like this. This is very close, certainly in terms of uh, picking, to that famous lick from, um, I can't remember the, in fact, I think it might be the same lick uh, from Extreme Rock One, the, or Extreme Rock, uh, is Extreme Rock? Um, the Paul Gilbert, instructional tape uh, I've told I think it is extreme oh, I can't remember now I'm, I'm, I'm losing my shred credentials as we speak but it's intense rock one that's the one it's, it goes like this and that will play the right notes intense rock Sacred God Slayer got there before me it's the intense rock one lick uh, or it might be intense rock two there's three of them it's definitely not three uh, I think it's the one with the rabbit um, I think that's number one because it's a pink guitar that looks like a Jolly Rancher um, anyway so we're going to begin by playing one repetition there two repetitions on all of our other strings let's try that and see how that feels start with the down pick we'll begin at a reasonably moderate speed so we'll go like this Try that. Ready? Two, three, four. One more time. Here we go. We play. Okay, if we're ready, let's try speeding it up. Let's try going like this. We go. One more time. Now, if that feels good, we're on to a winner. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to flip our picking posture back to the upstroke escape, where our pinky side bone is on contact with the guitar's body. Here, we're going to play two repetitions on every string. So it's six notes on the first string like this. And let's see how that feels. This may feel great. It may feel awkward. Who knows? Let's go. Ready? Here we go. Together. Should be okay at that speed. Let's go faster. Let's go. And again. Let me know how that feels. Let me know which one feels more comfortable to you because we can take some little takeaways from here. What we can take away from this is that if you're happy doing downward uh, picks landing or the upstroke escape uh, approach going this way, and you're happier doing the opposite, doing a downstroke escape approach going this way, then you're probably a good candidate for economy picking. If by contrast, you're happy maintaining one of these postures in either direction, then you're a candidate for a single posture style. 
like Zach Wilde or like Vinnie Moore or like Ingvar Malmsteen. Loads of great players use these approaches. Um, or uh, John McLaughlin, for example. Um, John Petrucci to an extent, um, although not so much. He talks about being ambipixtrous quite a lot, but he does tend to lean more towards one another. That might be you. You might be a, a player who stays in this posture the whole time or stays in this posture the whole time. That can work too. If you go and they all feel pretty easy, then you may be a candidate for true alternate picking, which is something you'll see from Aldi Miola, Paul Gilbert. Uh, who else to use this? It's kind of rarer than you'd think. More players tend to stick in one posture than another. Examples of economy pickers, for example, or directional style pickers include, but are not limited to, uh, Frank Gambale, Guthrie Govan, uh, myself. Um, who else does this? Uh, there's lots of great... Alex Hutchings uh, does this a lot. Lots of great players who have all these different approaches. The, uh, the one-way thing, you find some players who stick in one posture most of the time, but will occasionally dip into others. Annie James is one of those guys. Um, who else? Nuna Betancourt, uh, but the other way up. Um, John Petrucci is primarily this way, but sometimes dips into the other way. Um, th th the point with this is... All of these guys are successful. Sean Lane, somebody mentioned Sean Lane before, Sacred God Slayer, primarily in one direction, occasionally swipped, like dipped into this other one, but it was mainly just this one way. Now, all of these players have successful strategies that they, they can work with. The key thing with this is just taking a bit of time to begin with, while well, you're getting used to this, to organize your lines, organize your licks, so that they play into your picking strengths, as opposed to working against them. And there's no rule that says you have to play lines that finish on an upstroke, or lines that finish on a downstroke, and you're, you're only allowed to play this. And never allowed to play this. Etc. You, you're, only, you're only allowed to play with one repetition here, never allowed to play two repetitions. Or you're only allowed to play patterns that, you know, repeat a certain number of times nonsense right we're just about finding something that we can do that's a cool flurry of speed at this point so whatever strategy happens to feel the easiest for you lean into it don't be afraid to blend it with some other approaches so you can blend it with some legato if you find that easier that works too so you can play things like for example uh, if we play this line <laughs> one of our lines from previous weeks, that's a little more challenging because we have to change our pick posture part way through. We can do some legato stuff with that. We can go. Well, we start to incorporate some legato notes in the mix to help us give ourselves some time to navigate from one string to another. These are all perfectly valid ways of playing none of them are bad and we get lost in this idea that there's a prescriptive way to play it's kind of not the way it goes so if you want some more information on this right we're gonna we're gonna leave this for this week but if you want some more information on this we will be answering questions so if you have questions drop them down below but uh if you want more information on this we've got a great course in guitar in gi plus which just goes into massive detail on all of this stuff. It's called Picking Strategies Part 1. We talked about this last week, but I'm going to show you again. This is Picking Strategies for our friends who are interested in this stuff. Uh, you get it as part of your GI Plus membership. It's the only place it's available. So go to guitarinteractivemagazine.com forward slash GI Plus to get this course. Uh, I think it's great, but I made it. So you can be the judge. Check it out. When we come back, we'll be answering your questions. <laughs> Does your picking feel uncoordinated and sometimes you miss notes or fluff transitions from string to string, maybe a little bit like this? When in reality what you want is smooth and easy and transparent feeling picking, a bit like this. Or maybe you've 
been sold on the idea that there's one specific way that you have to pick on the guitar and everything else is wrong, but that particular cookie cutter approach just doesn't work for you. It feels unnatural. It almost feels like you're fighting your own body to try and make it work. Well, Picking Strategies Part 1 is the course for you. In this course, we explore the many different ways that you can form a full and complete and comprehensive picking approach by examining the various strategies used by some of the greatest pickers of all time. And there are a whole bunch of strategies out there, and I guarantee there is one that is going to work for your preferred picking mechanics, the way you prefer to stand or sit with the guitar, the type of guitar you play, the type of music you play, there is a strategy for you. We're going to explore all of them and I'm going to show you how you can take a single solo study and play every line within it using all of the six picking strategies that we look at in this course. And of course, this entire course is available as part of your GI Plus membership. So if you're not signed up already, what better excuse do you need to sign up today? That's Picking Strategies Part 1. I've got to apologize to you guys about hearing the loud clip and sound, by the way. The loud clip and sound is me sitting on my microphone clip, is what I'm doing. So I'm just going to move that. I'm going to move it out of the way, because uh, that is very much user error. So the loud clipping that you guys are hearing, it's me sitting on stuff. Uh, it's not even just a technical fault. It's just me. It's a human-based fault. So got some questions. Uh, I'm going to highlight a few of them. We've got a great one coming from Mustache Metal. Uh, he's saying, first of all, it says, have you seen... Uh, Anton Oparin's lecture on picking. He believes there is such a thing as a universal technique that everyone hypothetically could have, like athletes. Still unsure, but fascinating bit. I haven't seen it, but what I will say is if the premise is that there is a universal best technique uh, for athletes and we are like a universal best technique to run or to lift or to throw or any of that sort of stuff, um, then... I would say that's a flawed premise because I don't know if that's the premise. So this is me speaking from ignorance. I haven't seen the video, but the idea that there's a universal technique that works for any sport is contrary to the evidence. It's not true. Uh, if I take my own sport, for example, my own sport is powerlifting, which I know a little bit about. Um, not the best powerlifter in the world, but turns out reasonably competitive for an old man. Uh, I, I may... Uh, I've qualified for British Nationals this year. I may even make it to European or even World Championships. I'm not going to win, but uh, I'm not that good. But uh, I, I might be allowed to go, which is pretty cool. Um, who knows? I, I don't know. There's bound to be people out there who'll take that place. But based on the numbers, I'm potentially able to go anyway. We used to labor under this assumption that there was a specific way of doing the three disciplines, the squat, the bench press, and the deadlift, that were better for all people. Turns out when we actually put um, imaging on individual athletes, um, athlete to athlete differences are enormous, relatively enormous based on the uh, athlete's anthropometry, different uh, muscle and tendon insertions, uh, preferences, injury history. Um, if you then factor in things like uh, the type of guitar that you play, all that sort of stuff, going back to guitar, I think that's, there's going to be huge differences. But most importantly, this is the really fascinating bit, is there is significant difference within one athlete. Within, If you took an athlete and you put, like, scope, what's the word? You put pads on them where you could see where their joints were. You would notice that their technique is anything but consistent we see significant varied like rep to rep variation in uh elite weightlifters elite powerlifters elite throwing athletes uh sprinters jumpers you name it we see huge variation within so this idea that there's a universal technique that's perfect for one sport there isn't a universal technique that's perfect for a single athlete it, it varies 
The body is a very sophisticated machine with lots of complicated ways of solving mechanical problems. So I, I'm gonna watch that video because I'm really interested in it. I'm really interested to see what he has to say, but if that's the premise that there's a universal technique that's, that's ideal for sport, then that's coming from a flawed premise, uh, I would say, because that's not, that doesn't match the evidence we have for, um, it, it's, not, it's not the evidence that is currently thought to be the best evidence in the world of sports science, let's just put it that way. But it's a really interesting video, I'm gonna make a point of watching that, and it also got me a little soapbox there for a second, and I got to talk about powerlifting again on a guitar stream. What are the odds? Um, I'm gonna stop talking about that, <laughs> because it's not very interesting. Um, so anyway, uh, on we go, we've got some more great questions, let me just highlight some of the ones we've got. So first of all, helmet strap says, uh, I don't uh, seem to pick in a straight line. If I start between the pickups, I'm ending up near the bridge. That's okay. So what he means by that, if we go to the close-up cam very quickly, I'll show you what's going on there. What he means by that, I'm guessing, let's go to just the right-hand close-up cam if that's okay. Um, and I'm gonna hide your comment helmet. In fact, no, I'll just move my, my guitar. I'll move myself, we'll keep the comment there. What you might mean is this idea that if you start between the pickups, you start here and gradually end up here, that's totally fine. The reason for this is it's gonna feel like a straight line, but every movement we make at the wrist joint is a rotation. It has to be because we, we're not just like literally like sliding the wrist uh, to and from on an axis, like, um, like the head on a typewriter, it rotates around a joint. So it is rotational by its very nature. So that, that will happen. It'll feel like a straight line, but it won't actually bear out as a straight line in, uh, in real terms. Humans don't move in straight lines at any joint the reason why we have uh, biarticular joints um, or you know we have like so with the if we move our arm if we go back to the main cam like if I move my arm uh, in this direction to and from you the hand appears to be moving straight but the uh, the the upper arm is rotating up and the lower arm is rotating down and the wrist is rotating as well the rotational joints but they work together to create straight lines a single joint will be more rotational that's normal so you don't need to worry about that uh, i think that's just kind of a it's it's something i've heard referred to as a twood uh it's something you don't need to be worried about but it's definitely something worth ob observing so another quick question or, or more a comment really here's a really good one from timothy appling it says the more i practice the easier it gets um what about uh since you're only using one pick per note what about uh one pick per three notes that's a perfectly valid way to pick so um that would be more of the uh I would say more of the classic rock legato approach, where it's not really legato, but it's hammer-ons, pull-offs. Uh, you see this in Joe Satriani's playing. Um, you see it a lot in Paul Gilbert's legato playing, for example. You see it in John Petrucci's legato playing, where we activate the string with a pick stroke and then let the left hand do the rest. That can work too. That can work really, really well. So one pick per three notes. It's a fun way to play, and if it feels comfortable and allows you to get the pace on the go, lean into it. Again, you don't have to pick. There is no rule. Alan Holdsworth is not a, a, a better or worse guitar player than Sean Lane, let's say, it's a, in terms of being a technician. Taste, that's notwithstanding. You can make that decision yourself. Uh, you know, or like, it's like the whole like Tom Quayle, Martin Miller, who win, both win. Um, but anyway, so, because it's not a sport, but uh, even still. So anyway, uh, some more very good questions. Uh, Sacred God Slayer, has a really good one here where he's talking about the, um, ah, we'll highlight this one first. One of the problems in changing strings that many don't consider is the elbow compass movement. Uh, how many times the hand is badly aligned with a set or two of more strings? 100%. What he's referring to here is the tracking of the elbow to keep the hand aligned on the string. Now, if we keep our elbow fixed in position, let's go to the, in fact, let's stay on this camera. Let's stay on this camera. Um, that's probably the way to do it because otherwise we won't really see what my elbow is doing. If we keep the elbow fixed in one position, in order to get from the low E string to the high E string, we have to rotate the hand and end up at kind of like an end range of motion, which is a bit cumbersome. What we do instead is we use the elbow, as he's pointing out here, to flex uh, and extend, flex and extend the elbow, um, to get us from here to here. Let's take a look at the difference. So from here to here, with just wrist, a bit awkward. From here to here, with elbow, pretty comfortable. That doesn't mean you always have to move the elbow to get from one string to another. If you're on a pair of strings, you can probably do that with just the wrist and keep the elbow in one position. You can also use the wrist to get from string to string and then allow the elbow to catch up as you go through the strings. That's okay too. 
you'll see that in Paul Gilbert's playing. It almost becomes this wobbly snake kind of thing. It's a little bit like the wobbly pencil illusion where, um, you know, he plays and then like the, the, the wrist appears to be wobbling. It's rotating to and from like a drum I play in the hi-hat, but also the elbow's moving. Just looks like a really fluid movement because it is. Um, so yeah, that's a really valid point. That's something definitely worth taking a look at. Got some more comments coming in live. I'm just gonna quickly check in with some of those. Um, we've got some comments about the technical difficulties, Lake. We've got some love for the uh, 80s and 90s RGs. I have, oh, next time I'm in my studio, I'll bring it out, um, which will be next week. I have, uh, I have an 89 white RG550. You can see the state this guitar is in. If you want to see what 10 years of practice does to a guitar, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get the guitar out for you because it's a mess. Uh, and it was pristine when I bought it. Um, I didn't buy it in 89. I bought it in like 2001, but it was pristine. Uh, and then from 2001 to 2011, I played it relentlessly, probably longer actually, relentlessly, and just wore this poor guitar into the ground. I'll show you it next time. Uh, next time, remind me though. Somebody on the stream say next week, "Hey, show us your RG," because I've got it kicking around. Uh, it's a really, really cool, really, really cool thing. So anyway, um, we got some other. Uh, really great questions coming in here uh, with Steve Morse. Yes, that's why Steve Morse said working on alternate picking so much. Uh, it was the approach uh, that let him forget about directions, for sure. Now, Steve Morse is an interesting cat, though, because uh, we see all of these, uh, these movements in Steve Morse's technique. And Steve Morse is also a bit of a unique case because he has a very unusual picking posture. He holds the pick in a very unusual way. Uh, and he also does this thing that probably only Steve Morse does. It's, it's almost to the point where it becomes a Steve Morse thing, Steve Morse-ism, which is where he plays, uh, let's go to the two close-up counts, where he plays uh, one note on each string with alternate picking, like this. Which I'm not very good at because... It's very, very difficult to do because you can't do that with a straight line picking movement. You have to have curvature there, and that has to be very finely dialed in. Um, it, Cowcats is, and his approach screwed his wrist. I, I'm going to push back against that because I don't think it's necessarily the approach that screwed his wrist particularly. I think it's, uh, as with anything else, overuse injuries are rarely about the actual technique itself, and they're more often about the dose, if that makes sense. The dose makes the poison there. And Steve Morse was doing this very athletic technique for hours every night with Deep Purple and practicing on top of it and not getting any younger and also flying airplanes, uh, which is pretty tiring on the wrists, and also um, had pre-existing injuries that went along with it. So I think it was a combination of things. I don't think we can necessarily point to the te technique and go, oh, it was that. Uh, it's tempting to you, though. It's very tempting, very tempting. So anyway, listen, guys, we have run out of time. We've run out of time. I am going to, uh, I'm going to have to curtail that there because we've already run over. But listen, if you have more questions, we're back here next week. I'm going to be in my own studio as well. Uh, we're going to be going over more stuff like this, getting you guys ready for some shred. Uh, shred ready. Shreddy ready? I guess here's a fun one. Oh, it's a comment from James. I was going to say, James, somebody else has an Alvarez scoop. But James has the Alvarez. Is the, is the Alvarez scoop here, James? It's here, right. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna just waffle for a bit, and James is going to grab the Alvarez scoop because this is cool as out. Seriously, fat. what's it tuned to, James? It's down a tone. I'm going to play the outro on the Alvarez scoop because it's cool. Is it in tune? It needs a battery. It needs a battery. I can't play it because it needs a battery. It's an active guitar, but let me show you this. Uh, we'll just fly this in camera. Look at this guy, right? This, that is the most early 90s guitar I've ever seen in my entire life. James, I don't want to put this on the floor because it's a lovely, it's a family heirloom. I'll give you that back. It's really cool guitar though. Really cool guitar. Uh, anyway, in the meantime, we're going to play some more notes. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Nick Dennis from Guitar Interactive, GI+. Plus. I will see you guys next week for more Shred. Uh, let's play out in some, uh, let's do Dorian. We haven't done Dorian yet. Uh, we have backing tracks for all modes. I'll see you guys next week. Uh, you get them on the YouTube channel. If you're not subscribed to us, you know where to go. If you want more guitar lessons, you want the picking course that goes along with this, go to guitarinteractivemagazine.com forward slash GI hyphen plus, or just click the link down below. Go get the lessons you want. In the meantime, see you next week. Take care. Bye for now.
GI Plus membership. I'll do it again on the camera. This is what you get as part of your GI Plus membership. Take care. My name is Nick Jennison and it's a pleasure to introduce to you GI Plus, the brand new lesson platform brought to you by Guitar Interactive. We've assembled a team of the best players and educators in the world to bring you exclusive lessons covering everything from metal to blues to fusion and everything in between. Want to level up your shred chops? Check out How to Play Fast by Andy James. Or how about Sweet Picking with Rick Graham? Maybe country's more your bag. Well, how about a full-length exclusive country guitar course from Andy Wood? Interested in learning how to play over changes? Well, members get access to hours of exclusive lessons from fusion maestro Tom Quayle. Or maybe you want your playing to sound more soulful. Well, who better than Chris Buck to show you how it's done? Or perhaps you want to learn the secrets of the masters. Well, members get access to over 60 feature-length tech sessions where our tutors painstakingly decode the styles of players like David Gilmore, Eddie Van Halen, John Petrucci, Larry Carlton, Flash, Tosin Abbasi, Paul Gilbert, and many more. You get all this along with exclusive live webinars, free backing tracks, competitions, and so much more. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for GI Plus today.